We're getting a look inside NFL free agency with Austin Eckler, who recently signed a two-year deal with the Commanders. Plus, A-Rod and Mark Lurie are going to mediation and they're going to try and come away with the Timberwolves. The Kansas City Current is building a multi-use development around their stadium, and the name of the Utah NHL team will be decided by a fan vote. It's Wednesday, April 24th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The Minnesota Timberwolves are embarking on one of the more exciting playoff runs in their history, and by the end of it, they might even know who's going to own the team. A mediation between current majority owner Glenn Taylor and Alex Rodriguez and Mark Lurie is set for May 1st in Minneapolis. A-Rod and Lurie already bought 36% of the Timberwolves and Lynx and were set to become majority owners when Taylor said they missed a payment deadline and opted to keep the team. There are three paths this can go down. One is that Taylor is made to comply with the initial terms of the deal and go ahead with the sale at a $1.5 billion valuation. Another path is that Taylor is allowed to pull the team off the market and remain majority owner. But mediation is generally about finding a compromise, and so the third path is something in the middle of those two, which would presumably involve Rodriguez and Lori becoming majority owners but buying their next portion of the teams at a higher valuation. Forbes valued the Timberwolves at $2.5 billion in October. That's before including the Lynx, which would likely add something in the neighborhood of $100 million in value. All of that is predicated on the idea that A-Rod and Lori will be able to find the money, because their struggle to do just that is what led to this whole situation in the first place. Angie and Chris Long, owners of the Kansas City Current, are building a massive development around the NWSL team stadium with significant help from the public. The team will build housing, retail, and restaurants around their stadium, which opened last month. The first phase will include $200 million in private funding, and the entire project will cost an estimated $800 million. The Port Authority of Kansas City approved a bond of that same amount for the project last August. The authority is also allowing developers to not pay most of their property taxes for a 15-year period. The area they are building on is public land and doesn't currently generate tax revenue. The plan is for the entire thing to be finished by 2026, when Kansas City will be one of 16 host cities for the World Cup. The arrangement stands in stark contrast to the proposed $2 billion deal that would have allowed the Chiefs to renovate their stadium and the Royals to build a new stadium using proceeds from a sales tax. That was rejected by voters earlier this month. The current deal sidesteps the need for a public vote. And speaking of votes, the incoming Utah hockey team will pick its new name using a fan vote bracket. There will be eight possible names and fans will vote on them until there is one left. It's a bold move, but it should be fun as long as they come up with eight solid options. Trademarks have already been filed for Utah HC, Utah Hockey Club, Utah Blizzard, Utah Fury, Utah Outlaws, Utah Venom, and Utah Yetis. We have previously discussed all of those except Outlaws. Outlaw is just an old-timey name for criminal, so that probably shouldn't be the team name. It just feels like one you're going to regret at some point. We don't know what the actual bracket is going to be at this point, but of those options, Yetis is still the only good one. And if that's still true, once we see the official options, I think listeners of this show should band together and do what we can to make the Utah Yetis happen. Joined now by Washington Commanders running back Austin Eckler. Welcome, Austin. Thanks for having me back on. Great to have you on. Um, yeah, I was just telling you offline, you are our third guest in the history of this podcast. So fun little full circle moment for us. And it'll be good to kind of get an update on how things are going with you. Um, I want to start with your recent past. Uh, so you um, you just signed a two-year deal with the Commanders after spending seven seasons with the Chargers. Uh, I'm curious about the experience of free agency because it's freedom and it's insecurity in one package. How in control of your future did you feel? Yeah, free agency was was kind of wild this year because I think there was a there was a really a flood of the market of running backs. You know, the guys that got franchise tagged, and then the 2017 class really hitting the market. Um, and so it was it went quick, it went really quick. And I know it was uh, quick for me anyway. That first day that they were able, other teams were able to talk to us. Um, people started right, getting getting obligation obligated. Um, contract signed or I guess the, the obligation sign you can't sign yet until it actually opens up but people are getting some commitments going uh, and I just remember going back and forth all morning with my with my agent um, uh, hey man like you need to stay next to your phone we got to go through here's our parameters what we're trying to get um, this is the environment we want to we want to try to go into and so we started chipping away through okay hey this team reached out this is what they offered okay they're out they don't they obviously you know don't want you to be used or they want you as this type of position um, 
we had a conversation with the Chargers. You know, they were going in a different direction, and so I was like, okay, let's go find a new place. And then the Commanders really stood out above the rest um, as far as a, a opportunity to really come in and make an impact early on, um, and also uh, be really in a situation where hey, we're trying to we're trying to get ourselves right back together um, and put a, put a team together, really get some leadership uh, in with the team. And so that's exactly where, where I was looking to be in. And then we had coach Lynn out there who I was familiar with. Um, and there's a lot of new coaches and I've kind of been through that before. Um, and so it was, just, it was an environment where it was like, Hey, it's a new opportunity, a new, new coast. Um, and so I'm looking forward to this next, next year. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. I was going to ask you how quickly your market took shape, but it sounds like it was more like hours than days. It was, it was definitely hours. So that day, I forgot what day it was, but you know, I'm, I'm in the gym working out and I'm starting to see some of um, the younger guys go off the board. I'm seeing Saquon get picked up immediately. Josh Jacobs yep. gets picked up. Um, and so then I'm like, all right, you know, some of, some of me, Derek, um, Aaron Jones, um, some of us other guys were okay. We're still on the board. Let's see what's going to happen. So we're getting calls here and there, and then all of a sudden, we, hey, we start getting offers. Like, oh, we're going today. Um, this is probably going to get done. And sure enough, ended up getting done. It was funny. Funny story. Someone, I think, from the organization leaked the deal that was sent over to me because I was getting sent what the deal offer was before I even had agreed to the deal or anything like that. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Okay. The deal's out there, but I, I haven't said yes to it. People send me congratulations and all this stuff. So, oh, wow. So uh, that was interesting. But um, yeah, ended up obviously yeah. agreeing to it. And now I'm out here. Um, so they were just a little premature. Yeah. And was that, what was that moment like? I mean, do you feel like they just got ahead of themselves and assumed you were going to say yes? Or was there some motivation <laughs> I, there? Or? Yeah, I really don't know. Um, you know, maybe that maybe it was a tactic they were using like, Hey, let's leak this and get the, you know, get them excited. I don't know. Um, but it ended up being, like I said, the terms that, I, you know, we agreed to. And so now I'm out here, uh, mm -hmm. in Washington. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm curious about Washington specifically, how much is the, the new ownership, uh, as opposed to the old ownership, how much did that, you know, uh, make it an easier decision for you to come in? I think it's, I mean, for me, I, I never had an experience, you know, with the previous ownership. Um, and so for me, it was really, hey, there's a new opportunity um, going on. Obviously, you see stuff in the news, but I wasn't really a part of the the culture here. Um, I just know that right now our culture is is really alive and it looks very, very fruitful. Um, you know, a lot of young guys in here, a lot of, you know, guys that we've brought in that have, you know, have worn the C on their chest before and, and are really showing up and starting to continue to in implement this new culture that Dan Quinn is trying to bring in. So I don't really like to focus on the past. Like, hey, we're moving forward. This is what we have now. So that's where I'm trying to trying to stay and trying to push forward. Yeah. And speaking of moving forward, you mentioned being in more of a leadership role here. You know, the commanders, you know, they're they're kind of an up and coming team or sort of still finding their identity. They've got the number two pick in this draft. Um, how are you kind of thinking about this year? And, and it's a two year deal. So, yeah. How are you thinking about, um, yeah, these next couple of years in terms of your role? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to win now. I don't have time to wait, you know, and see how this stuff plays out. We got to win now. And I know that's the philosophy. Um, and, you know, we've seen we've seen other teams come in and do that and flip their season around. You know, watch look at the Texans last year, for example, and that you can go through other examples as well. So that that's the mentality that we have as well. Like, we're not trying to, you know, oh, let's build. The, we can build the identity in one year. And what does it take? Well, it takes us being in the, here in the off season. It takes us establishing a culture who we're trying to be. It takes us being around each other, creating that camaraderie with our team so that when we go out there, we can play at a high level and know we have each other's backs. Um, you know, we have talent on this team. Uh, there's talent all across the NFL, but it comes down to your chemistry and it comes down to, you know, coaching and playing. And that's that's what that's what's going to put the product on the field. And as long as we're aligned with that, as long as we're using our strengths to our advantage, uh, we're going to be in a position to to win games. And so I'm trying to win now. Like I said, I ain't trying to hang out and and wait to see what happens. You know, whoever we get in the draft, welcome to the culture. Hey, get acclimated. And we got to roll. Yeah. Um, it's no secret that some teams are taking dollars that in the past would have gone toward running backs, putting them toward other positions. How much were you feeling that dynamic through your free agency? Yeah, it's it's an interesting um, time in the running back market right now. Um, I think there's a few factors that play into it. Maybe supply, uh, maybe just the landscape of the NFL, uh, the, the running back um, market as far as, hey, what how value is getting um, 
produced and, and really graded. Uh, I think there's a situation for us to continue to make an impact on a team and continue to, for me, justify why we should right continue to be you know a staple of of your offense and why you should want to go out and find a good running back um and it comes down to us continuing to make an impact and you know we, we've seen that um over the past few years um especially with you know some of our top guys even especially last year with josh jacobs um th- well i guess two years ago this last year with christian and some of these other guys and especially um some of these tandems that we're seeing come out too um if guys just like with uh, Gibbs and Montgomery, that was another one where guys are out there right, holding it down for their team. Um, and so to me, hey, that's justifiable of, hey, you should be paying these guys. Um, and that's that's what I want to see. I just want to see guys get out to the open market and get, a, get an opportunity to get paid. Um, and, yeah, so I think there's a lot more that needs to go into looking at what's going on in the running back market um, that we can get into on this call. But obviously want to see our guys continue to make an impact and get rewarded for that. So in addition to all that, you also have, have other projects outside of football, namely your, your platform experience with an EK, like your name. Um, so uh, we talked about it a year ago. It uh, looks like now you're, you're largely focused on student athletes. So actually first tell us what experience is and where you're trying to take it. Yeah. So I think an important thing to know about me um, as an individual is I really am big into opportunities that bring communities together. And uh, I think there's a lot of different, a lot of different entities that really extract value from, from sports, which is great. It makes the ecosystem of sports. Uh, But I really wanted to bring an opportunity to athletes that brings value back to, to the athlete. Um, And and that's form of connections, that's form of monetary value. Um, And that's why I built experience is really to bring the community and give athletes and fans a way to connect and bring that emotion, bring that love of the game back and keep it in the ecosystem around the athletes and around the fandom. And so experience is a platform that helps connect athletes and their fans in a more meaningful way and a more efficient way too, because with athletes, it really takes a lot of time if we're trying to connect with a ton of athletes. So we need a safe environment and an environment where we can control the the volume of interactions that we're doing. And so with experience, what I've been doing is optimizing ways for you to either cheer me on at, you know, for a game, for you to right, jump on a video chat and talk to me for a few minutes here and there for you to, you know, ask me about my off season, um, different things like that. If you want to, if you want to, you know, give me some motivation before a game. Uh, if you want to talk about a big game after just different types of inter- interaction and active ways to, to connect um, throughout the entire year. Um, this is the place where you're going to be able to do it is with experience. And yeah, you, you're right. We've been focusing in the NIL space and the, in the student athlete space, because now there's a new opportunity for student athletes um, to, to monetize their name. And when you think of that right now, the landscape is really in the brand space but in the brand space, you're taking a lot of these random brands that these kids don't really have any affiliation with or any value from, and they're promoting them, you know, randomly. And I think it's I, I think it's a, a okay opportunity, but I think there's a real bigger opportunity of creating an opportunity in the actual fan base itself and letting letting these these alumni go in and support these student athletes. For example. If you're a football player and you're a business major during the off season, what better opportunity to get paid? But than talking to your alumni about, you know, different opportunities in the business space and they're, they want to support you. They also want to connect with you and they can also give you nuggets to help you further your career and look for the next opportunity or during, during games, especially in the college space, as far as the camaraderie that's there in the college space where, Hey, you have a big game coming up. That's a perfect opportunity to funnel all of that community support into your team to have these fans. Hey, go cheer on our team. We got a big rival game coming up. Or even it's just, even if we came off a loss, Hey, go pick up our team spirits. Hey, if we come off a big win, Hey, Hey, go show those guys some love or those girls some love. Um, and it's an opportunity that, that promotes the players and it promotes the school as well. And so it's not promoting some random brand. It's actually bringing the community closer because we're all here celebrating and supporting the thing that we love. Even if like you don't have like, you know, a hundred thousand experienced followers the way you might on Instagram or something, or, you know, a platform where you can monetize it that way. It's maybe a more tight knit thing where if I come right. to you with, you know, some kind of, product that I have an NIL deal with, it feels more, more personal, more catered to this specific. Yeah. And let me give an example. Cause I I look at kind of the NIL space right now and I'm on all the platforms just to do research. And, you know, there's opportunities for me to make $25 to promote this brand that makes socks at old t-shirts. And it's like, that's 
a business that you can go promote and you have to go and look at their website and you have to promote on their, you promote on your Twitter, promote on your Instagram. And it's like, you could do that or you can join experience with us and then you can make that same $25 and it's actually one of your alumni cheering you on for the game or giving you a tips of, of how to navigate the business, um, the business um, industry as far as in your, in your experience there as the, as a student, uh, Hey, these are the people that you should go meet. Hey, this is what I learned. Hey, if you're looking for an internship opportunity, this is what I would suggest. Um, and you, you're getting paid to interact with these people. They can send you, you know, a, a message and you would get to respond. Oh, thank you. You know, thanks. Oh, and I appreciate the, the, the support or thanks. Oh, and I appreciate the advice. I really love that. I would love to connect with you on a deeper basis at some point. Um, and so it's a more supportive way that is, like I said, it's promoting not only the the student athlete, but also supports the school as well. And so that's why we're looking to get the schools involved in this as well and really turn it into a white labeled product. So it's not just one on one. So now the before, let me back up before the athlete would have to promote it on their own. And we're, you run into issues there because not everyone has a huge following, right? That's that's dependent on the name on the back. Hey, what have you done for yourself? Well, now when we put, put in the school's hand and white label it, you're also attacking the name on the front of the jersey, which is the school's name. And you're going to already have brand loyalty to the actual school. And so if you can incentivize the school to also want to promote this for their student athletes so they can continue to build support through their CRM, they start to know what types of fans are actually wanting to interact with their students and put those people into their different, you know, advertising funnels for, you know, tuition for, you know, um, different, you know, events and so on. Now you can really create an ecosystem where not only are the student athletes getting an opportunity from their fans, they're also giving an, we're also giving an opportunity to the schools to continue to actually utilize and learn about their fans at the same time and expand their CRMs and their capabilities of talking with these um, individuals. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, just thinking about how schools have dealt with the NIL era, you know, some are, are you know, have, have really benefited from it in that they can essentially pay their players and, um, you know, for doing some some charity events or whatever that they have them do. And it's a way to, to, to get the recruits they want. Some, I think, are still trying to figure out what this is and how much they want to play in this space. Um, but... Uh, yeah, it, it just kind of oh, yeah. this interesting kind of like chaotic situation yeah. still, even a few years. And in. here's the thing. What really dominates the space is these brands. And yeah, you mentioned the, you know, the the appearances that you can do for the charitable endeavors. Um, those are those are, you know, few in between. And those are absolutely there. And you can see that really in the collective space. Um, but now to me, what NIL means is using your name and what you've built for yourself. Um, and, and when you bring brands into it, um, even if it's charities, you're bringing what you've built and what you have built for you and your predecessors, and you're pushing it to other products. Like, hey, everyone go look at these products over there off of the name that you're built, you've built. And so you're taking that attention and you're selling it away to someone else, which is, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, as long as you're aligned with the brand and you understand Um it makes sense. You should do those. I would encourage you to. I do brand deals all the time with companies that I love. Uh, but there's also a situation where, okay, if you just continue to do 25, like it, it, the ROI is not going to be panning out if you're trying to do a bunch of $25 brands and brand deals and pushing your, your interest out. You're going you're gonna to exhaust your fan base because you're giving them stuff that they don't necessarily want. Why are they a fan of you? Because, of, because you, you, you wear their jersey. They, they like you. They're like you, Owen. Like they're a fan. If I'm a fan of you, Owen, I want to see your, you and your stuff. I don't want you to give me 15% off discounts on every store that you, you know, that you could you can find and get your hands on. Like I want to interact with you in some way, or just I want to support you. Or I want you to know that I'm supporting you in some type of fashion. And so that's what we're building. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Uh, I want to uh, throw a few quick NFL questions at you before we let you go. Uh, the hip drop tackle is a thing of the past, or at least that's what the rules say now. Uh, how do you feel about, about that new rule coming in? Um, you know, it's, it's definitely uh, one that has caused a lot of attention to be uh, directed towards it. Um, I'm, I'm in a position where I just want to make sure that when we are implementing these rules, that there's a good collaboration um, in the future, because it seems that when these rules are getting made, it's almost like it's a trial. Let's throw it out there, see how it works. Um, and, you know, I would love to have more input as a player um, in the executive committee um, 
with the NFLPA where, hey, we, we want to be in these conversations. We do have a seat at the chair, but, um, you know, it can almost be overlooked sometimes. And so just want to make sure that when we're creating rules that it is for the greater good of our players and entirely um, and not really try to really toy too much with rules. Um, like, let's make sure there's a plan. Let's make sure it's solid instead of just really trying things. And this is this is a scenario where it almost seems like we're trying it to see how it plays, but it can, I know it can really affect um, the game and even – um, you know, for throwing fines in there as well, affect our guys' play, uh, you know, pocketbooks as far as just how we have been playing the game in the past. So just want to make sure that we're careful, you know, as the NFL and the NFLPA and collaborating on these. Because I'm, I'm, I'm in a situation where, like, hey, we're going to see how it goes. Um, it's hard for me to say whether I like it or whether I don't like it right now. I can tell you that I'm very skeptical. Um, so we'll see. Uh, yeah, I'm a little surprised to hear that just as someone who is, is going to be uh, you know, maybe has more more room to move. Um, well, you know, let me that, ask you this. Role in place. Let me ask you this, Owen. Um, like, who's gonna who's supposed to teach this? You know, is, mm -hmm. it, is it the coach's fault? Is it the player's fault? Is it both? Um, and so that's where I'm coming from. Where it's like, okay, like this is just being sprung on you all of a sudden out of nowhere. Where we've been tackling a certain way for the entirety of the sport's existence, and now all of a sudden you have to change how you tackle. Uh, sure. And so yeah. it, 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 you're changing the fundamentals of the game. And I just want to make sure that we're in a situation where as a player representative that we're protecting our players and allowing this time to actually, you know, come to fruition in a proper fashion. Um, and so when it sprung on you like this, kind of kind of blindsided you. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, any thoughts on the modified kickoff? Modify kickoff is super interesting, actually. Like, yeah, it's yeah. gonna it's gonna make that play I think a, a lot more viewable um, because yeah. we're probably not gonna see a touchback every single time, uh, right. which is you know oh kickoff touchback okay you know you can go you go to the bathroom right then and there you know yeah. and so I think it's gonna make it a little bit more exciting. I know there is some safety concerns that we're trying to um, you know make I guess less of a concern um, with, you know, having less impacts, uh, less high speed impacts with this. So I'm really curious to see how it plays out. I'm, I'm interested because it's, it still keeps that spot of the game. Like you still have the, you know, the traditional kickoff, you know, it's not necessarily as much field being covered, but it's still, it's still part of the game. So I love that. And uh, let's, let's make you commissioner for a day um, or, you know, dictator or whatever. Someone, someone who can <laughs> make rules at a whim. <laughs> uh, what, what changes would you like to see in the that NFL? Was, that, that was interesting ver verbiage there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'm not sure if the commissioner has all the authorities I want to give you right now. So, yeah. Just what changes would you like to see in football? What changes would I like to see in football? Wow. Um, to what degree? On the business side? On the playing side? Wherever your mind's going, honestly. Yeah, I mean, if you've got some thoughts on playing, but yeah, if you've business thoughts too. And I would love to see sports. more global expansion. I think we've been doing that a lot. I would love to see the game continue to expand um, to get to a brand where, you know, you have, you know, a soccer as a, as a global brand. And I think we're getting there. I know we've been doing international games for a while, but I would love to see more of that. Uh, I don't know about having a team over there because I have made, you know, the trip over the pond and played in that game. The time change is kind of brutal, um, but I would yep. love to see a little bit more expansion in that capacity. Um, and shoot, I, I would really love to see too during the off season. Uh, I think it, it's a great time to get football into the community. Um, I would love to see more, more efforts on both sides, NFLPA and NFL of just continuing to spread our wings and bring people together around the sport. Because I think it's one of those things where now it's become a really dominant sport in, in the United States, um, and which brings people together. And I'm about bringing people together. So, Hey, let's, the more we can do to bring, and I, I think I see it too, right? I see it with the flag and now the Olympics. Uh, and so that's another opportunity. I see even, I see flag fo football in for, for girls in high school. So I think we're on the right track but more more of that so i want to see i want to see this game all over the place because i think it does an amazing job of bringing communities together and on that global game point uh where would you mostly if you could play a game anywhere in the nfl not i mean sorry any country any country. um not necessarily one that the nfl is playing in this year or last year just if you could put a game somewhere ooh, if i want to put a game somewhere where are we going huh 
Australia might be interesting. Ooh, all right. And, and I hear that, that might be interesting. You know, a possibility. I mean, like, that the logistics is, is yeah. Like yeah, I mean, that's like England times two. <laughs> um, so in terms of sort of that trip, but it'd be fun. I mean, you know, they they love rugby. I think they love yeah. the NFL. Yeah, yeah. And so, I, do, um, I do know. I actually had a couple of my teammates go to Australia and play in their football leagues over there. Rugby is definitely more predominant than um the nfl over there but they also have a different structure like high school sports is not a thing in australia right it's all you have to go to like club right outside of or just club in general all the time so i think that'd be interesting but would love to see this game in some capacity you know compete with soccer on the global scale yeah and we may be getting there uh os neckler thanks so much for joining us on the show yeah thanks for having me on owen that's it for today. Leave us a rating and a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, or share this episode with an NFL fan you think would enjoy it. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.